thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, we'd like to start by thanking Barbara Caston and Martine Sims for being willing to join us for this conversation with Alex Klein and for um, participating tonight. And then we also like to thank 356 Mission for co-presenting with us and setting up all of this wonderful um, equipment and chairs and setup for the evening. We really appreciate the space. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, also thank Leah Trinka Browner and Wendy Yao for all the work they did on this event. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Shannon. Thank you. Um, we also want to thank the undergraduate area of USC Rossi School of Art and Design and the Hammond Lecture Series. Uh, the photography area at Roski has been fortunate in receiving a gift from Jan Hanman that has allowed us to host large photography-based lectures as well as classroom lectures for the past 15 years. Uh, we're grateful to Jan Hanman for her generosity and continued support of the photography program at Roski. So we're going to introduce our speakers now and tell you a bit about each of them. Alex Klein is an artist and the Dorothy and Stephen R. Weber curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Selected exhibitions and initiatives at ICA include Barbara Caston Stages, 2015, the first major survey of the artist's work, Consider the Belvedere with Tamara Henderson and Julia Ferrer, 2015, Avant Gardner, Ian Hamilton Finlay, co-curated with Lynn Farrington, uh, Vish Vish Vishal <laughs> Jundio, and Education in the Logic of Leaves, Excursus 1 through 4, featuring a reference library, East of Borneo, Uga Booga, and Primary Information. Um, she also served as an agent in the Carnegie Museum of Arts Hillman Photography Initiative with Tina Kukilski, and her writing has been published in collections including How Soon Is Now, uh, published by Luma 2012, The Human Snapshot, Sternberg Press, CCS Bard, and she's the editor of the critical volume of photography, Words Without Pictures, LACMA Aperture, 2010. Uh, previously, Alex held positions at the Wallace Annenberg Photography Department at LACMA, Rossi School of Fine Arts and Design uh, at USC, and at the Met. And she is co-founder with Mark Owens of the editorial project and publishing imprint Oslo Editions. Um, <clears throat> now I'd like to introduce Martine Sims. Um, she is an artist and she's based here in Los Angeles. She's the founder of Dominica, a publishing imprint dedicated to exploring blackness in visual culture. Her artwork has been exhibited and screened extensively, including presentations at the New Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, MCA Chicago, Green Gallery, Jean Siskel, Film Center and White Flag Projects. She has lectured at Yale University, South by Southwest, um, California Institute for the Arts, University of Chicago, John Hopkins University, and MoMA PS1, among other venues. Sims recently presented the exhibition Vertical Elevated Oblique at Bridget Donahue Gallery in New York. Forthcoming exhibitions include Electronic Superhighway 2016 to 1966 at Whitechapel Gallery in London, and then Come Port Ment at Karma International Los Angeles, and Fact and Trouble at the ICA London, a solo exhibition. Martine's discursive practice has had an explosive presence over the last two years. Through a number of exhibitions, lectures, performances, publishing, writing, manifestos, and a documentary she co-directed for KCET's Artbound series, The Mundane Afrofuturist Manifesto. I first spoke with Martine about her work publishing in Chicago at her solo exhibition, The Queen's English, at the Armory in Pasadena in 2014, which featured a work titled Black Lesbians, um, a shelf of books that one could browse and um, could browse through and corresponding photographs inspired by a librarian 
Roberts' bibliography, the J.R. Roberts 1981 annotated bibliography, Black Lesbians. It was no surprise for me to find out her work um, was then included in the New Museum Triennial in New York last year. However, it was her solo show at Bridget Donahue, paired with her recent performance lecture at the Broad Museum last month, and her current show of giant-sized video projections at Human Resources that has given me a deeper understanding of her work. In her performance at the Broad, Sims used her computer desktop as a collective collage and virtual stacking space for stills, quick times, audio, and text that illuminate her thinking about representation of the black woman's gesture. This currency, which she has called it, which often manifests in gifs and memes, is played out in her outstanding video, Notes on Gesture, that uses an actor mimicking repeated gestures, looks, partial phrases, um, that can be viewed on Dis Magazine's website. We'll see more of her work this summer at her upcoming exhibition um, and also in May in LA at the Hammer Museum. Okay, I'm gonna introduce Barbara Kasten. Barbara received her BFA from the University of Arizona Tucson in 1959 and her MFA from the California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland in 1970. She has had solo exhibitions at institutions such as the George Eastman House, the International Museum of Photography and Film in Rochester, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the International Center for Photography in New York. Her work is held in numerous museum collections, including Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art here. Her work was recently the subject of a major monographic survey, Barbara Caston Stages, the ICA, in uh, Philadelphia, and the exhibition traveled on to the Graham Foundation in Chicago and will, presented, will be presented at MOCA in LA in spring 2016. Um, Barbara Kasten has consistently made some of the most stunning and beguiling images of the past 30 to 40 years. By drawing on a vast base of knowledge accumulated over time and rooted in her multivalent practice, Kasten's work has come to define a way of working that is poly. Trained originally as a painter and textile artist in the 70s, Kasten went on to work extensively with the medium of photography starting in the 80s making large-scale installations of objects in space that were as much sculptural installations as they were tableaus for the camera. While artists today may take a non-medium-specific approach to making art as a given, it is Barbara Kasten who has come to define such a practice. Last year, I was lucky enough to visit Kasten's ICA Philadelphia exhibition, expertly curated by artist Alex Klein in close collaboration with Kasten in aptly titled Stages. Walking through the show, I was struck by Kasten's shifting frameworks, moving from fiber works that engage sculpture and the figurative to experimental cyanotypes and diazotype prints on newsprint, to Memphis-style photographs from the Con Construct series, to images from the mid-2000s that dealt with geometric abstraction, and finally to her most recent video projections, which I'm sure we'll hear about here tonight. As I marveled at Kasten's vast body of work at the ICA, I was struck by how it seemed that everyone was always catching up to her, crossing terrain where her work had already been. Lucky for Los Angeles, MOCA curator Bennett Simpson will be reinstalling the stages exhibition with Alex Klein in May at the Pacific Design Center, and we will all have the opportunity to see for ourselves how pioneering a figure Barbara Kasten is. So please join me in welcoming Barbara Kasten, Martine Sims, and Alex Klein. Thank you. I'm gonna say one more thing quickly that I wanted to dedicate the night to the undergraduates of the Roski School. So this is for you. Well, first off, um, I just want to give a profound thanks to Jennifer and Shannon for having us all here. Um, it really has a special meaning for me. Many years ago, I believe I probably organized a, a Hanman lecture series, and it was no turnout like this. So um, you've worked really hard to make this happen, so we really appreciate it. So thank you. 
Um, and it's also really special to be here uh, at 356. Um, and I hope Wendy is here somewhere, but I want to say thank you to Wendy and uh, Leah. Um, in fact, I think the first time I met Martine was when you were working at Ogabuga in Chinatown. Um, and so that's, it's, I have fond memories of that. Um, and actually, the furniture that's out in the Ogabuga uh, store is actually from the ICA installation that Wendy did with us in Excursus. So there's a lot of really nice connections. Um, so when Jennifer and Shannon asked me to think about someone uh, who would be a good conversant uh, with Barbara, um, because so much of what Barbara's and my conversations have been when we were developing the survey has been uh, very much about in conversation with other artists. And um, you're always looking forward, Barbara, and you're always talking to other artists and looking at other artists, and you come alive in that context. Um, Martine immediately came to mind. Uh, Martine, who uh, many of you may not know, actually used to work with Barbara uh, in Chicago. So uh, very early on in the research process, Martine and uh, Marco Kane Braunschweiler were uh, two people who I really engaged in conversation about Barbara and thinking about Barbara's relevancy as a contemporary image maker and not just uh, thinking backwards. So uh, it was a no-brainer um, to invite Martine here tonight and also uh, to now think about your images in relation to Barbara's and both as producers. Um, so uh, I think tonight we'd really like to focus on that conversation between Martine and Barbara because as uh, Shannon mentioned, uh, we're really excited um, to be bringing the exhibition here to Los Angeles in May. Uh, I believe it opens in May 28th. Um, so there'll be plenty of time to think back over the arc of your career, and tonight I think we're really going to think about the conversation, and that's not to say that we can't um, you know, elaborate on particular bodies of work or, or kind of focus on moments, but um, feel free to kind of, uh, I guess, point to those in the question and answer session. Um, so I think we're going to start by focusing on the present by looking at two uh, recent shows. Um, we're lucky that um, they've each uh, have many surveys of sorts on at the moment. So Barbara's going to talk about an exhibition that recently opened in Germany, and Martine is going to talk about a very, very new exhibition that just opened at Human Resources, and then we'll come back into a conversation. So thank you, everyone. Okay, I have to speak very close to this, so we'll see if I do well enough. Um, I'm showing you um, the first image um, of three rooms that um, were an exhibition that I just opened a couple of weeks ago in Dusseldorf at the Cadell Wilborn Gallery. And it's, um, the title of the show was called Staging Architecture. And we approached it from the past and uh, the, uh, the immediate uh, um, work that I, current work I was doing, and then a site specific work that I made uh, for the installation. So, since it all dealt with architecture, it started, the front room started with these. Uh, large SIBA uh, photographs that I made back in 1980s. Um, they're actually the original prints from that time. Um, and um, SIBA chrome, as some of you might know, is no longer available to be printed. Um, so um, it, it was interesting to see a room full of these old prints. Um, and I guess, you know, I used to mat them with great big white mats around them. That was the old style back in the 80s. But now, to keep up with the way things um, are going, I took away the mat, and now they're just framed right to the edge. Um, the works were done um, at powers of in, uh, institutions of power, uh, actually. Um, they were. The sites were chosen. I chose the sites um, uh, from financial institutions and um, art museums, uh, both of which um, I had access to, one through Vanity Fair magazine, which had sponsored the first shoot I did. Uh, so the whole series started as a commercial 
uh, enterprise, which never got published, by the way, but they were the sponsors and they opened doors for me in these um, institutions. This um, first one here is the World Financial Center. And um, <laughs> what you're, <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought too. <laughs> Um, there's a, this is a, a view um, through the camera in one direction with mirrors hanging within the frame facing in opposite in other directions so that you get an overall uh, kind of environmental uh, picture all at once. Um, most people who see these images um, run you know go up to them thinking that they're um, they're digital montage, but they're not. They're actually uh, very high production um, overnight shoots with uh, a crew of 12 people and uh, all the um, ramifications of making something like that happen, uh, Hollywood style, um, which I think is an influence from being and living in LA. Uh, so this was, um, the, the series that started in New York with these financial centers uh, uh, with uh, Vanity Fair's help, and then to continue working this way, um, I didn't have the same access that they had, so I kind of went forward to um, the museums, which also were institutions of power, um, and um, this actually is not a museum, um, but it is the Loyola Law School and it's Frank Gehry's design from uh, the 80s. Um, it, they were all postmodern buildings and they were commentary on postmodernism. That was in the first room. In the, the third room, I'm passing by the, the middle room which had the installation, were a couple of um, new works that um, I feel are very architectural in nature and actually um, reminiscent to me of an experience I had uh, looking at um, Corbusier's uh, church at Ronchamp, the reflection of colors and um, uh, the palettes that I remember from that time. Um, so there's a couple of those here for you to see. There's a series of about 25 that I did. Uh, also printed in that very large scale. And since they're recent, um, they couldn't be done in Cibachrome, but I found another uh, photographic process that I felt uh, was the best for, um, for these works. Um, ink on paper, which is the most prominent way or the most uh, um, relevant way that people are, are making uh, prints these days just didn't work, so I had to find a real photographic process, and this is called Fuji Chrome. Um, but it was the photographicness of it that appealed to me. So now to the center room, there's two or three stills here of the most recent um, video uh, installation, and um, I chose uh, primary colors um, and um, and the simple cube shape um, that you'll see, I have a little video clip for you to see, uh, revolving um, in this corner of the middle room, which also happens to be a cube shape. And um, so there was reference to the architecture it was made for and, uh, and actually reference to, I think, architecture in general and seem to really uh, resonate throughout the other early and later bodies of work. What I've done here is a, um, it's, it's um, cubes that were revolving on a disc um, in a horizontal manner, uh, but now projected um, vertically. Um, and you can't see it here, but there's, uh, since they are the, a real object moving, this is not um, an animation, uh, you can see texture and, and feel the reality of the shape and the cube and the form. 
but it's all centered around the, um, the corner and um, rotating in a pattern of, of uh, color so that it, it patterns uh, the rotation of um, the primary colors. It's um, projected in the corner with a uh, software, a mapping software. So um, it looks very simple, but it's actually a very complex uh, piece to do. Okay, I think I can leave it at that and <laughs> send it to uh, this over to Martine. Hello, everyone. Um, right now, I have a show at Human Resources. I just opened on Saturday. It's called Black Box. That is a installation, um, sort of three channels, of a series of videos that I've been working on for a little over a year. Maybe it started in 2014, and they're all called lessons, so they're kind of just number, lesson one, lesson two, and so on. And there's 60 that are on view at Human Resources. And the videos started originally after a commission from the Walker Art Center. I did a talk there in 2014 as part of their Design Insight series. Um, and my talk was sort of organized around these five lessons, um, which are from Kevin Young, who's a poet and writer. He has a book called The Gray Album on the Blackness of Blackness. And in the book, he sort of articulates these five lessons that he calls like the lessons of the tradition. Um, so like the first lesson, I think, is uh, uh, no, I'm not going to remember the first lesson. The third lesson is struggle. I know that. <laughs> that one's easy to remember. Um, but I started, so originally Walker asked me if I'd want to make, you know, kind of five videos for these. And I was like, oh, OK, I'm going to make like commercials for each lesson, sort of like ads, 30 second spots. And as I started making those first five, I was like, well, there's got to be more than just five lessons. And so I continued sort of writing and making commercials for these ongoing lessons. And so that's what is on view at Human Resources. And it's sort of, if you've been there, you know, it's a very large kind of rectangular space and uh, a kind of sort of square space. And so three of the walls are basically extremely large projection. And the, the lessons were meant to sort of work as a modular sort of narrative so that they continue to tell a different story um, depending on how you play them. And so there's a kind of computer program basically that's just reorganizing them into different configurations that alternates on these three screens. Um, it's open Wednesday to Sunday, 12 to 6. <laughs> you can check it out. Um, but I just want to show these are some of the videos and that's kind of the most recent project that I've been working on. Um, but it's sort of tied to maybe the way that Barbara and I started working together, which is really in video installation and projection, which is something I don't typically use. I actually prefer, in most cases, to use a kind of screen and a monitor and thinking more about um, that type of presentation. But for this, the encounter of a sort of body in space was really important and really my initial um, I'd worked for other sort of video artists before but working really on Barbara was a lot of sort of fleshing some of those ideas out and starting to think about mm -hmm. how installation can work and how video can sort of be architectural mm -hmm. so I think that um, that's a great really immediate tie there so thank you that was a great lead in because that was one of the first things that struck me seeing your show this afternoon, Martine, was um, how much you're aware of your body in relation to those projections. And of course, that's something that Barbara and I have been talking a lot about with the recent turn in your work as well. So kind of just taking a step back, if, if you could talk a little bit about, I guess, how you did first uh, meet each other and um, some of the conversations that you've had over the years. Well, I think uh, it was me looking for somebody to help me uh, learn something about video um, because I knew I wanted to add a motion uh, to the work that I was doing. And um, I knew about Golden Age um, Bookstore, uh, which uh, Marco and Martine 
were running and a, f a friend of mine brought me in there and I introduced me and then Martine reminded me that it was actually uh, one of my ex-grad students that brought us together, right? Yeah, it was Greg Stymack who <laughs> sent me an email. Barbara was looking for some help. <laughs> and first thing I know is I get uh, Martine um, coming in and, and she actually helped me more than just the video. She helped me with a lot of things and it was wonderful because she was one of my, she was maybe the first, well she was the first serious uh, assistant, I should say that. And uh, uh, I was working on a project with um, a woman in Chicago, uh, Candida Alvarez, who had a, a little um, uh, exhibition center in her studio was kind of a closet that that faced out into a hallway and um, so I wanted to, she asked me to do something in it and I said oh I'm really interested in project with uh, video these days but I you know have never really done a site specific one so that's where my team came in and and helped me figure that one out do you remember that little closet <laughs> I do remember that closet, <laughs> in fact. Uh, that was fun. Um, and uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, also, it, it also involved a mirror. It was very simple. It was, again, a corner, which seems to be the kind of architecture I'm interested in uh, these days, a very essential piece of construction, and a mirror which expands the space and, and changes the whole perception of what the space is about. Um, the moving part of it, um, which I, no, we don't have that one, I forgot, okay. We didn't, I don't have a clip of that to show you. But, um, and then soon after that, uh, another project came up and uh, Martine and I worked on that. It was a big, a huge uh, room installation, and we used the video we had just done for um, the closet, <laughs> and then added a couple others, and it became the first really major um, piece that I, I've done. Um, and then, if you remember, you helped me also make the um, the little brochure and um, CD, right? So she brought a lot of talent into my uh, view, into my studio, and helped me uh, really take another step forward. It was really wonderful to have a very young, talented artist share their own experiences with with somebody like myself. You know, she was very open and happy to. Um, to help me make my work, and I think that was a very generous and wonderful place to start our, our long friendship. That was like, when, 2009, we thought, yeah. Yeah, and I think f uh, for me, I, I was familiar with Barbara's work, um, but I didn't know that she lived in Chicago, actually, until her and Teresa came in. So Marco and I used to have a, a sort of project space bookshop in Chicago that was called Golden Age, really inspired by Ooga Booga, uh, which, as was mentioned, I interned at sort of very early on, maybe first a year or two. And um, <laughs> once I moved to Chicago, I went there for school. Um, I was immediately kind of like, oh, I want to open a space like this. So I came back the following summer, and then Wendy really like showed me kind of how the space was run so that when I went back to Chicago, we could set it up. So that was started like 2007, right when I graduated. And, uh, Teresa Luisati um, runs Luisati Gallery here in Santa Monica. Brought Barbara in just to kind of check it out. It was a space that she'd heard about, um, and so and that she was also Ram Publications. Yes, Ram That's Publications what is also what she does, and so that was sort of our initial connection. And then maybe like two weeks later, I just a friend emailed me about, you know, a job opportunity, and I was looking for work. <laughs> so I, you know, because running your own artist bookshop isn't the most lucrative, believe it or not. So I started working with Barbara, and I was really excited about, um, you know, all of her work, really, especially, I think, um, as you see in some of the kind of initial images that she showed, you know, this sort of, like, flattening of, of space mm -hmm. and um, 
sort of pushing just that two-dimensional plane of what a photograph is and even some of her work, sort of what the image is. Those are all things that I was just like really interested in thinking about and it was fun to just kind of start. You know, she, in terms of her process, it was just very instructive to me as far as like, you know, you really like are very print oriented, printing everything out, putting it on the wall, like doing so many test prints. And then also sort of as the video making process goes, kind of continuing to layer the image and layer um, sort of this the set really and work with the set. So that was something that I was just immediately really drawn to and learned a lot from. Mm -hmm. And I want to get back to this idea of the set, because it's something I'm personally very interested in. But I thought maybe we could just take a second to look at the, the remix piece that was one of the culminating uh, moments of, of the two of you working together. Um, this piece is called Remix. And um, one of the things that uh, was really rewarding about this is that um, not only was it a huge space that we were filling with three videos um, in a very environmental setting, there was also um, a music component. And uh, because of uh, Martine's uh, uh, friendship with the uh, Lucky Dragons, um, they allowed me to use their uh, music carte blanche, they were just incredible. They just sent me clips and said, do what you want to do. I mean, have you ever heard of somebody releasing that kind of, uh, you know, uh, of their proprietorship to, uh, to another artist? So this music is theirs and um, my rendition of theirs, how's that? <laughs> so maybe we can watch a minute of that and just... <laughs> to see what is actually going on there. Um, but really one of the main things is that it really, um, because one thing that some of you may not know is that all of Barbara's photographs are actually, actually this is a great example, is that they're actually sets that are done uh, to scale to the human body. So all of the color you're seeing in the images is all done through lighting and reflection. And we're talking about large scale uh, stage sets that she's building. This is that, that image was actually from an exhibition that she had where she had set up a large tableau and made images out of it and left the sculpture on view. Um, but so what was interesting about that, and actually um, I'm seeing some of my former colleagues from LACMA here and I want to say hello to them because that was actually at, at LACMA where I first uh, met Barbara in person for the first time and that would have also been around 2008. Um, you walked in one day um, and we ended up doing a, a public conversation with you and we got to know each other over the years so it's been very much a conversation. But this uh, moment of stepping back out into space. So even though space is embedded in her images, um, you, around that time, were starting to kind of work um, spatially again in terms of projection, seeing, seeing video in relation to architecture, the body in relation to architecture, not just on the picture plane. So it was a real kind of um, important step for you because fast forward to the present, um, you're really playing with this question of illusionistic architecture um, in the show at ICA, for example, we had that large corner piece, the piece that you just showed now. So um, working with Martine on the remix uh, piece and the piece before that was really um, something that you were really trying to figure out. And now fast forward, it's much more resolved in relation to how you're, you're playing with this kind of analog uh, image in relation to a kind of a digital mapping and architectural space. So 
Like, yeah, I've learned a lot since uh, <laughs> Martine set me on this uh, course. Um, and, um, and it's uh, really interesting to be able to work in uh, specific sites to create a, a, um, an installation, a video installation, which I have to say I'm really fortunate because of the ICA show and the two or three uh, locations that now um, it's going to, I've been able to do um, a different video installation at each place according to whatever space is available there. The first one being that very tall corner um, piece, um, and a 30-foot one at ICA, and then um, we just passed a, an image of a horizontal, very colorful piece, and that was at the Graham Foundation. In that one, I actually had objects in it as well as the video. So um, it's, it's been um, a, um, uh, an idea that I've, I have actually participated in, in making the photographs where I'm actually in the set, I call it, uh, in a way that um, it, I relate to it as a sculpture, and then suddenly I'm behind the camera relating to it in, in that form um, as a photographer. Um, and so it's, it's, um, it's been a, an interesting progression, but also um, kind of a circular one. I think Martine has, you know, used the body in a, in a different way in some pieces. Except you did do an installation. I just saw the video of oh, the slides of it tonight. I didn't see the installation thing. That was in New York, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, actually, um, right, I think oh, it's, it's coming, coming up. up. Yeah. yeah, but actually, that leads right into my next question, which is. Um, here we are in Los Angeles. They're both, this is both a formative place for both of you in terms of artistic production. Um, Barbara lived here in the 70s and it really formed the kind of the basis of your, your ethos as an artist. Martine, LA is incredibly important to you. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, using the kind of the, the tools of the city to do other things. So that by that I mean the kind of the commercial industry of Hollywood um, and kind of ripping it apart and remobilizing it in other ways. So for example, that most recent show of Bridget Donahue, Martine, you had, you know, C stands out, um, you know, kind of colored flats like up, up against the wall, showing the backdrop behind the video um, and really kind of showing the seams of of what usually Hollywood tries to obscure. And then Barbara, of course, talking about uh, the architectural sites where she's actually using uh, a film crew to light up a building, for example. So Martine, maybe you would like to start with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think for me, really, starting to use these things came from just like being in a more commercial setting like for work and being on a lot of sets and shoots and things like that and being really fascinated by um, the tools, especially if you could stop thinking about what they were like meant to be doing and just starting to think about them kind of formally and this sort of tie between the production of images and the way they circulate and then like a creation of them or sort of like, um, you know, like deconstructing them, I guess. And so that, that for me was really starting to, and the C-stand really just came about very, like actually just being at work and like needing to hang something mm -hmm. for the book fair and being like, oh, I could use a C-stand to hang stuff on. And then kind of just keep going from there. It's like, this, it's also sort of represents then just this, this tool of production. And I maybe have been using a lot of my print sizes as being tied also back to, um, you know, like scrim size or, or different kind of uh, lighting tools mm -hmm. and, and thinking about the way that the um, these objects are kind of used to just produce a lot of images that, for me, tie back into a biography of I can kind of trace myself by different, you know, like pop cultural moments. And that was really important to me. I also grew up in Los Angeles. I wasn't, my parents did not work in film or anything like that, but um, weirdly, I, I homeschooled and my mom would like have us do like extra work just to make money basically for whatever we wanted. 
And so I would always be on set, but I was really a bad actor. I still am very bad at that. <laughs> and um, so I would never really have to be uh, kind of primary, but just like kind of being in that environment. And, and some things just look so strange. It's like the back lot, like that kind of uncanniness of it is something that is attractive to me. Um, and then I think also my studio is sort of around like garment district and this commercial signage. And that's another thing that's very sort of Los Angeles to me is, is just the repetition of this sort of commercial signage. So that's another thing that I, I tend to use a lot is a lot of the vendors, um, you know, at various like swap meets um, and using that kind of text um, of just encountering the city or, or walking around in the same vein, I actually, some of the very early photographs that I made, uh, some of the parts came from um, uh, down on, uh, ben not, not Venice, but on um, Santa Monica? I don't know, I can't remember the street. Venice Boulevard? One of those streets. <laughs> <laughs> down on the west side, where they have all the boating uh, supplies. Um, that was also something that, you know, I got from there. It was just because I was wandering around looking for some sort of different kinds of implements to use. I like using things out of place, and I like showing it if I can. So in the photographs I did, um, now I don't do that as much as I try to show my own hand in a photograph, that mark on the plexiglass or the, the rough edge from something being cut irregularly. I like showing those sort of blemishes and letting, letting people see the, the reality as well as the fantasy of, of what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, LA, for me too, was, um, you know, I lived here in the 70s and, um, and the work at that time was much more uh, of a hands-on kind of thing for me because I wasn't a photographer per se. I was actually, um, you know, working in, in the studio and I was building things and I found out that I could photograph them when I discovered um, 8x10 Polaroid. So that was my first foray into photography was through the use of, of Polaroid. Um, I don't know, I guess what I, what was I thinking when I started <laughs> that? I but then you also go on to use film crews, yes, people who are right, working on, right. you, know, uh, you know, mainstream movies to then create a, a singular right, image right. too for right. very and when I And when I decided on the architectural sites uh, on a new location, I came back to LA to do it. So I, I still felt very much uh, part of the, you know, the industry here, so to speak, and, and the influence of the, of the industry, which is what you're dealing with, all the influences that that kind of uh, imagery and commercialism has on, on us. But also, I think, um, like you're saying, you maybe started doing photography more from 8 by 10. I think my entry into ph photography was also similarly, I mean, I was really interested in, like, Super 8, kind of filmmaking and really through the Echo Park Film Center was really heavily sort of started with a small gauge, more consumer format. And I think that kind of back and forth between a like low end mm -hmm. image or a poorer quality image and higher quality image and this kind of play of production value is also something I try mm -hmm. to bring into the image or trying to make something appear like it's been found in a certain place mm -hmm. where it is, where it hasn't. And I mean, maybe we can go back to this idea of a directorial mode, but leading off of what you just mm -hmm. said, I think um, there's an interesting tension in both of your works about uh, kind of materials, materiality, analog, digital, um, the way that, you know, in both of your pro uh, projects, there is a kind of, um, there are works where you literally crumpled your material and then smoothed it back out. Um, Martine, the show at Human Resources has this very, you know, the, the kind of the style, poor image, uh, found VHS kind of quality, but then it's this a, a video projection. So it's a, it's been this kind of translation between analog material and then uh, a kind of a slick digital environment. Not that it's slick, but you know what I'm saying. And then with Barbara, there's also been this kind of presumption that these analog images are somehow digitally produced, but they're actually incredibly material 
and very slow in a way. So I'm, I'm very interested in these kind of slippages about how we, we also add information sometimes when we look at things and claim them for the digital sphere or vice versa. Um, and I'm wondering if you, if you have any thoughts on that kind of on the level of materials. Well, today when we went to see your show, I really love the fact that some of the, the huge image just covering the entire, well, three walls entirely, not um, at the same time, but one would be so totally out of focus, you could hardly read it. And then the next one would snap in and you, you could read it. And I like that kind of juxtaposition of, of textures, really, from, from that kind of thing. Yeah, I think for me that is each sort of format or like, you know, camera that you're using or the sort of quality of image that it provides is really just different textures and different, um, you know, I feel like, like you're saying, Alex, like people like fill in information mm -hmm. about where that thing's coming from. And I like to play with that kind of assumption of like where it's from or if it's found or if it's not found right. and sort of obscuring my own maybe like process process of research and of, of, of making really yeah um, I mean and the found not found is another interesting um, tension I mean just thinking I mean some of these images um, of Barbara's you know where there's actually found materials from architectural supply uh, stores but then also there's things that are being constructed in the studio kind of attention between what's mass produced what's handmade and similarly there's this kind of archival footage that you have that some of it is things that you're making, some of them are things that you've actually found, some of them are personal, and you're putting them in, in, a, in a singular space. So kind of confusing the viewer about how to understand these materials. Um, and we were talking earlier about uh, the question of quotation um, and how that functions and the referentiality. Um, and they function very differently in both of your works. And it's not to kind of draw, compare, contrast, but um, maybe a little bit more about about how you work with the sources that you do. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, a lot of my work sort of starts from writing. Like, uh, that's kind of the first thing that I do oftentimes is like, it, it's either for a kind of essay or for a more um, live address um, of the topic. And then, so when I go, from, from that text, basically, there's just a set of references and there's kind of uh, a set of, yeah, my, my footnotes or annotations, if you will. And then I think that's a part of, of kind of putting it together for me. And this maybe obscuring of found or not found or whatever is also just a way, I mean, we were sort of talking about this world of world building, mm -hmm. but also a way of kind of bringing these things all together into a narrative or into a structure that, um, yeah, asserts a kind of a, a world that someone can enter. So there's these points of familiarity and then you can go off from that. But I think, um, yeah, that's kind of mm. how it, my approach is. The, the most recent work that I did um, also started with a, a question for myself, which was, um, can, can a photograph really be abstract? Um, seeing that the photograph itself uh, or the camera itself needs an object uh, to photograph. So um, that was the challenge that, that started me off on this last series of work. Um, and some of the, um, the scratches and the physical nature of, of the material um, kind of like alludes to the fact that it's real but maybe it's not real kind of thing. But mostly, uh, I think my work stems from materiality and the, um, and the um, physicalness of it, either to, to the eye, uh, to the hand, to the experience of moving it around and having it um, respond to the light in a, in a certain way. Um, to me, the magic element is always the, the light that creates the shadow that defines the light. And that's more interesting to me than, um, uh, than just recording an object um, for its uh, representational value. But the body is so important for both of you, and yeah. embodiment. Um, I think that was the thing that really cracked the nut for me on your work, um, Barbara, was the moment that I realized that there were bodies at stake, and not just any body, but your body. 
Um, and so abstraction is interesting, is an interesting word for both of you actually in thinking of a way that bodies get abstracted, whether through media or whether through literal visual abstraction where you don't actually see the body in Barbara's images, but they're there. Well, and except in this one. <laughs> oh, except for this one. This is quite, so this is a very early actually, uh, speaking of the book fair, everyone. Um, <laughs> Both of these uh, wonderful artists have great books available um, that will be at the book fair. So there's events going on um, this week that we'll we be launching new publications. So I want to give a little shout out for that. Um, but uh, the, that image that we showed up there was from a very early work that Barbara did, the Diazotype series, which um, literally has the body with the grid. And that's really the kind of the starting point, the er moment in a way, mm -hmm. um, to kind of think about that body being there behind every one of those images. So um, I wondered if, if, if that word embodiment could be something that we could, we could unpack a little bit with regard to your materials, mediation, um, because bodies are at stake in both of your work. Well, I think the use of the materials um, by humans in forms that are different than my use of the material is something that's always interesting um, to me. Um, and um, yours is a more intellectual approach, I think, or conceptual approach to it. Mine seems to be more um, maybe intuitive or physical in its nature of the material itself. I don't know how you talk about that. Well, I also kind of think about the maybe just like footage as another kind of material, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and like that uh, my encounter with it or, um, yeah, and sort of like my relationship to the images that I'm encountering and how I can start to like construct something with them or also, um, I just blanked on what I was going to say. <laughs> me think, what was I just saying? Oh, I know what I was gonna say. Oh, and the way that you kind of, um, well, like you're talking about embodiment, I think a lot about how you like internalize or embody images that you see. Mm -hmm. So whether that's like something as dumb as like saving something that you wanna change your hair to be that style, mm -hmm. or um, you know, the video notes on gesture was a lot of looking at the way you sort of learn to move or adjust movements um, from videos that are seen or things like that, or especially like memes. I think a lot about, yeah, animated GIFs and um, Vines and how there's this, a real physical sort of presence to them where they have a physical um, result just from their circulation. Mm -hmm. So then a certain phrase starts to get said over and over again, everyone's kind of saying that, or a dance or something like that. and. And I was really thinking about, yeah, that way of embodying images. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But then I kind of to go what you're saying, and as I'm working on stuff, I'm very much sort of in it and like rifling through things and looking through things. And there's kind of my presence that's always there as well, or mm -hmm. the, the kind of absence of me or, or signs of me as right. well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, my process is is a, a back and forth between the sculpture in front of the camera and being behind the camera, and just being inside uh, these um, pieces of plexi uh, that I'm moving around. I think I see it differently than when I'm actually behind the camera judging it and as a pictorial plane. So it's one thing to be in three dimension and then to translate even myself into the two dimension, which is what I'm trying to do with the, mm -hmm. the materials it, themselves. Yeah, and I was actually, this uh, reading Trayvon Martin piece, I would say that's a, kind of a good example of, of just illustrating what you're saying, where I was like, um, this is a sort of web-based work that's just a personal bibliography, basically, of everything I was reading sort of after his murder, <laughs> and it's it's just anything that I encountered and read, I sort of saved, mm -hmm. and then it would be published to the site. And so there's always this kind of like me mm -hmm. that's there, yeah. or this subject. There's a, a, a 
sort of subject who's reading all these things, right. though then it kind of changes. I think that's another way of, I'm kind of thinking about embodiment. Right. And then, I mean, oh, sorry, go on. Well, I was just thinking of something I read um, about your show at The Walker where they were talking about how you were challenging um, your, uh, the question of identity through, um, how did they state it, something about your identity uh, as being challenged uh, to be your, um, Oh, God, now I can't think of it, too. I'm running out. Um, it had to do with you being identified by your process, by, by your art, that your art, um, and you were, they said in this review that that was one of the questions you were asking. Is that, did, am I making any sense? Oh, do yeah, you recall yeah, that? Yeah, I know what you're saying, I know what you're saying. Well, that was because with that piece, there was a, um, Kind of a while ago, this was like, I did this show that was in Milwaukee at the Green Gallery, and there was a piece that's called Everything I've Ever Wanted to Know. It's also web-based. It's just everything I've ever wanted to know com, And this was like, it's just a collection of like s saved searches, like things that I was searching for. And, um, and there was a, a woman at the show who was like, there were two other people in the show, and, there, and she was like, oh, this show, this is like, this is just like a white bro art. Right. Talking about my piece. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, and then the person whose gallery was, was like, oh, actually, this is Martine's piece. And then she totally kind of like changed her tone and was like, oh, actually, I really love this work. You know, I was just like <laughs> thinking about it. And so I think I was saying to them like how you know, I feel like, I mean, this comes up with me, I think, frequently, mainly because I use a lot of black subjects, so then people sort of just assume, actually, people often assume it's just me and my work, mm. you know, no matter who. So they project you. In yeah, the, yeah. Or they assume that you're Yeah, that if there's another figure that it's like, it's me, like this, yeah. the video, a lot of the stuff, almost everything that was written about that piece before was corrected all said that it was me in the video, that it was sort of me. In, so... Yeah. I think that's a part of, yeah, using all these figures mm -hmm. and this kind of slip of identity or that somebody can, you know, that there are all these kind of set of assumptions while someone's viewing. Mm -hmm. And I just try to, I think that's part of including this kind of production setting is, tr is try to put the kind of conditions of viewing into right. the viewing process. Yeah. That's something I think about a lot. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I, we have a lot of people here, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions, and I'm looking at the time, but I want to just ask one more thing, actually, about kind of the way that you've both decided to define your practices. Um, I think language is incredibly important in the way that artists get historicized and, and codified, and, you know, um, you know, thinking about Barbara, uh, you know, there's early interviews where you say, I'm not a photographer, I'm, I'm a sculptor, I'm a painter, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm all these things together, why, why call me one thing? And then Martine, early on, you, you gave yourself this moniker of conceptual entrepreneur, which now you're now having to kind of, you know, say, wait, I'm, you know, it, what is the, but it was, I, my understanding of that term was as a way to also elide categories and not be put so squarely into boxes before you were actually put in them. So I wonder if, if you, if both of you have a few thoughts on just, I guess, language in relation to how, how you're understood as artists, and then um, maybe we can pass the mic around for a few questions. Well, one quick thing to go back to the past is that in the 80s, there were, and I guess it still happens a lot now, there were a lot of um, um, women photographers, women photography shows, and I always kind of, stayed away from that because I hated the identity of being labeled a, f a woman, that a photographer, because somehow that seemed to make me different than any other photographer, uh, male or female. It was like, okay, this has to then, this work then has to look like something a woman would do. And it's like, what? <laughs> you know? So that always was uh, um, kind of irksome to me. And the photographer thing is, you know, I mean, I've been identified as a photographer simply because of the material that it ends up being produced on. 
but you know, knowing the process now, which uh, thanks to your looking at the work and presenting it at ICA, makes it uh, much more visible to, to know my process and to realize that it really isn't just, the idea isn't just to have a photograph in the end result, that, that the work along the way embodies many other disciplines. And uh, to me, that's really important. Yeah, I think, um, well, I was just thinking right then, like, it's funny that no one ever calls me a photographer, though I use photography so much, but... Um, well, you're lucky. <laughs> claim it, claim it <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, well, I started using this term conceptual entrepreneur mostly because once I got out of school, I was doing this space. I wasn't really making that much work, and so I just... I was joking with somebody the other day that I was like, well, you know, it just sounds better than independent contractor. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like kind of just taking two, actually a curator, Bart Ryan, he was like, it's two bad words. It's like conceptual, being a conceptual artist is a bad thing and being an entrepreneur is a bad thing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's the point. So. It was really just a provocation in many ways, um, in a way, I mean, I was like seriously like 19, it's like, I don't know why anybody was taking it seriously, but <laughs> I've grown into it, I would say, and more, more recently, you know, talking about it, and I think this sort of figure of an entrepreneur has changed a lot uh, as the tech industry becomes more and more dominant that, you know, the entrepreneur takes on all these uh, attributes that perhaps the artist took on at one point as far as like pushing culture forward, taking risks, um, so on and so forth. And for me, it was really just thinking about, you know, much more from uh, sort of creating a sustainable practice and just, um, you know, like a, a sort of autonomy, you know, from like, Black Panther's, you know, point three of ten point program being about economic sort of independence to, you know, yeah, spaces like Ooga Booga and being inspired like that or record labels and, um, you know, really coming from a kind of uh, like punk community of, of, of doing things yourself. Um, so for me, that was really where I was like thinking with that was, was how can I just make sure I'm not like losing money. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of gone on from then, but it really initially started just a, a very practically. And I was running a business. Like for me, people would always come into the shop and be like, so is this like a part, is this like an art project? And I'm like, well, it doesn't feel that way when you're like picking up like cigarette butts or like sweeping. <laughs> you know, like opening up your shutters with the next like store owner. So I think it was really kind of immediate for me and has only become more conceptual <laughs> over the years. <laughs> Rusu is just entrepreneur. Um, well, there's so many more questions that I have. I mean, the way color functions in both of your work, et cetera, but um, there must be questions from you guys. So um, is there a mic that we can pass around? I think there's one right behind you. Thank you so much for coming to Los Angeles and showing your amazing work. I have a very quick um, question and maybe you could give us a quick snapshot of the process, Barbara, from the beginning of the conception of the idea and the, um, you know, are you drawing, or are you painting and acquiring the objects and how long do many of these constructs take? The uh, process is actually quite lengthy. Lengthy. Everybody thinks a photographer just presses the button and then it's over with, um, and it's the beginning and the end. But um, my process takes days because uh, I would uh, I work in the set, build it, um, light it, um, it, make an exposure, develop the exposure, which is four by five film, and then. Um, make a judgment about that film, so go back another day, the second day, um, make adjustments either technically or aesthetically, do another exposure. It can take me a week uh, at least um, to, to complete the, the whole 
process. And then after that, of course, it comes the printing process. And so that, again, takes weeks because I don't print it myself. I work with a, a master printer. And um, in this case now, where printing has become so much more difficult, um, if you want a photographic process, uh, I have to go to New York to uh, actually print. So in a quick rundown of the process, that's, that's what happens. And that's another reason that the body is so important in your work, too, because it's very much about your physical relationship with these objects that are being moved around in space, and then your kind of optical experience of them. So there's always this tension between the body and the image. Well, yes, because I'm continually putting myself in the space, taking myself out of the space, judging it from another totally different pr uh, perspective. And so it's this sort of dance, this kind of a performative thing, actually, that happens. And, uh, and I feel that, you know, every time I'm looking, uh, I'm looking from another place, from another experience, and it's, it's a different... Uh, it's not just observing the world and photographing it. Martina, when I was interviewing you, I remember you did say something that one thing you learned from Barbara was just the incredible kind of patience and longevity of a career, too. And I think just because we have so many students here tonight, too, that's something to keep in mind. I don't know if you have just a quick thought on that or if that kind of sums it up, but that's something that really struck me was also just kind of watching that patience. <laughs> well, I have to say, I didn't really follow the trend. Let's put it that way. I did my own thing. And, and I think that's maybe, um, you know, I mean, you just keep doing what you do and you find that it's a, uh, the most rewarding thing for yourself to do. And then suddenly the world catches up with you. And thank goodness. <laughs> Surely there's another question for Martine or Barbara or both. I think technology is really important in, in my process because it's this marriage between the two that, that ends up either being a photograph or in now a video. I like the idea that I'm still working in an analog way and now I'm embracing certain aspects of, of the digital world. Um, but I'm not, you know, I actually have to say that's why I've met Martine is to fill me in on those aspects because I'm not, you know, um, I'm not ready to learn new technology, but I'm ready to use it, and and I like using it uh, with with a collaborate a collaboration like I did with Martine. I think for me, technology or my use of it is always kind of like an accelerating thing, like um, I only really learn to use new like programs, for example, like as needed, or like I'm kind of having an immediate, uh, I just try to figure out how, how to use something, if I need to use something else, that's when I learn to that, uh, learn how to use that thing. And so for me, it's always like just accelerating or like workflow, I'm a real workflow nerd. Um, so how can I just make my workflow like faster? Um, that's always what I'm trying to figure out. Or conversely, I guess I waste also a lot of time where I'm just sort of like wading through all this information and, you know, I'm really just, you know, a big, from libraries to digital collections to, you know, whatever, like Twitter, it's like I'm constantly just like gathering, sorting, saving, you know, filtering through. Um, so I think that access is a big thing for me and then like, yeah, accelerating efficiency, <laughs> high efficiency. The technology is actually really interesting for both of you. Um, 
Barbara has always been really fearless in trying new materials. So Polaroid, when that was like a scary new thing that approximates what we might think of as digital immediacy, she was right on that tip when she'd never even shot an 8x10 camera. And then, you know, diving into these video installations where she's still, even though she's still shooting 8x10 film, you're, you know, now using high, you know, high-tech mapping software to kind of take these analog images and put them back into space. So you've never really let technology be a hang-up. And then Martine, it's really interesting thinking about technology because sometimes it really acts as a material, like we were talking about that kind of aesthetic of the poor image, the kind of VHS quality, but also now you're finding yourself in exhibitions that are defining you by, the, by technology. So um, thinking about the Electronic Superhighway show at the White Chapel, which I just saw, which is really thinking of you in kind of an internet context. So it's interesting how technology kind of works with both, both of you, actually, in very different mm -hmm. ways. So. Um, do we have one, one or two more questions? Well, actually, they are pretty much um, improvised um, because what I usually do, um, I, I do have a concept of what I might be after, but not in a sketch form. Um, and um, once I decide on materials, for instance, in this latest series, um, which actually is this, and then afterwards, the next one, we'll show you the very latest. Um, I decided that I wanted the material to be transparent and non-representational. So I selected plexiglass um, because it had a physicality that when the light hit it would create shadows but still didn't have a form, have a form that had any representation. So I, would, I select the few pieces of plexiglass found pieces of plexiglass. I don't cut them and make them to order. I just kind of get them from old frames and stuff. And, um, and within that, I assemble this sculptural skeleton. Um, and they're not glued, they're not permanent, they're just leaning against one another, being held together by gravity. And if you find the right spot, it stays. It can stay a long, long time. Um, so, um, so there's judgment. My judgments usually are about the materiality and about um, the way light I I think might interact with the form until I see what it's doing, and then maybe I discover something it's doing I didn't plan on. Then I take it further. And there's that nice play on this kind of. You both work with props in a way. Props as sculpture. And in Barbara's work, there's often a literal propping also, so there's always this doubleness. Um, but of course, just to mention, uh, to clarify, the architectural sites were very pre-planned oh, well, because yeah. they had to be because there, she was working with film crews and cutting mirrors ahead of time and having to light up buildings. But And the expense of it all, you know, because right. it was a big production. Yes, that's true. That, but then that the studio was constructs are more intuitive and performative in the studio. And solitary. I don't work with assistants at all in the studio. But in that case, with the architectural sites, I worked with 12 mm -hmm. assistants. Right. I mean, and how, uh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say? say it is really like, you kind of just, she kind of described it as a dance earlier, but it really is like, I was just going to say, a lot of green tea, <laughs> music playing <laughs> loud, and like, Barbara kind of moving things around in the space and then going check the viewfinder. She has like multiple cameras set up that she's like, and then multiple kind of set set up that she's like, Okay, how's this one looking? Then kind of like dance around, move stuff around, <laughs> go to the next one. So it really is like. But not multiple cameras, unless you saw me one time with an 8x10 and a 4x5. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, I did do that. Very yeah. specific. <laughs> <laughs> but Martin, you're probably one of the few people that's actually seen that dance, because not a lot of people have. I don't even think I've been in the room when you've been doing that dance. So I think that's really very special, and that's actually a really nice maybe note to end on. Um, so I think, oh yeah, we've been going now for a full hour, so 
perhaps we should continue over drinks, or are there <laughs> final <laughs> words from our hosts? Thank or, you, guys. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much.